You see this street? How many different ways can you imagine this street being redesigned or reimagined? Five? Ten? A hundred? How about 700? Well, the answer is more than 700 because that's how many submissions came in when I asked all of you to help me redesign this street. About a month ago, I put out a video explaining how this street in my city is being rebuilt. It's being redesigned and reimagined because the neighborhood around the street has changed so much over the years. And I asked all of you to submit some ideas using this online tool called Street Mix. And I didn't know what to expect. I was expecting you know, a couple dozen maybe designs come in, but more than 700 of you submitted designs, which totally blew away my expectations. In fact, there was so much activity going on, the people at Street Mix actually emailed me to see what the hell was going on. So that's amazing. And today we are going to look at some of those designs. Hey everyone, I'm Tom and this is Shifter, a channel about urban cycling, bike commuting, and the ways we get around our cities. If you like this video, please consider subscribing. So obviously I can't look at all 700 submissions in depth in a video like this, although I did post a video at least displaying all 700 because I want the world to see them because they're amazing. But I did choose about 20 videos today that we're going to go through with a special guest because I wanted another perspective on this. I chose 20 videos that were uh, common designs or unique designs or interesting or creative or just plain cool. And we're going to go through them and talk about each of them in depth. But first, I want to give you some statistics. Of all of the designs that came in, 92% of them included sidewalks on both sides of the street. About 25% of you included lanes in your designs, which was interesting considering this is basically a channel about cycling. About the same number of you included bicycle lanes on one side of the street and about 50% of you included bike lanes on both sides of the street. And interestingly, 12% of you eliminated automobile lanes in your designs completely. Okay, we're going to dive into those 20 selections right now. And if you stick around to the end of the video, I'll show you the design that the city actually is going with. Let's go. Oh, well, here we are. <laughs> okay, welcome everyone. Special guest today. This is uh, Dr. Farnas Sajapur. Uh, she is an associate professor of civil engineering at the University of Calgary. And she also, more importantly, more importantly, not as importantly, but still important, rides your bike. You ride your bike a lot. You've done some research on cycling, yeah. urban cycling, specifically around winter, which is probably how we met originally. Winter, absolutely. Yeah, winter cycling. Winter cycling, mm -hmm. yes. Um, and we uh, occasionally pass each other in the snow That's <laughs> on <true>. the streets, <laughs> right. So um, thank you for coming. Thank it's great to have you. Um, I just want to share your insights. We're going to take a look at some of the designs today and uh, hear what you have to say and I'll share some of my thoughts. Okay, we're going to start on the first one. This one came from someone named Kat. And um, the reason I chose this one is because it's a good example of a common design. I would say this is the most common design mm. that was submitted. None of them are exactly the same, but the principles of this one were the same. And that was that a parking lane was removed. Two driving lanes, but one parking lane. But look, all, look what you can do <laughs> with that extra mm -hmm. space. This is an interesting look at it, isn't it? I, I like this very much. This is probably what I would have done if you asked me to redesign that street, knowing not that this is my ideal scenario, but knowing the culture and what the appetite would be in Calgary and what I can sell, this is probably what I would have done. One thing I do like very much about this design that I wouldn't have thought at the beginning is how they have used the trees as a barrier um, to the bike lane. So that's done very, very smartly. Um, so that half meter in each side. It's yeah, it makes so a difference, nice. doesn't it? Yeah. Like it, it gives a bit of protection for the cyclists yeah. and also having a tree there just makes the street so much better. This is probably where I would have went as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think you're totally right. This seems like a palatable thing. I mean, in a perfect world, I would say no cars, but you know, we don't live in a perfect world. So this mm -hmm. is a pretty good design. So all of you out there who like submitted um, a design that removed one parking, you're on the same page as us. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, next is an example of, uh, that was also pretty common, a one-way street. Now, this is one of the more creative interpretations of a one-way street. Uh, I don't know how you feel about this in Calgary, but one-way streets, like our sort of, the way we seem to deal with one-way streets in Calgary is that they become highways. Like, we, mm -hmm. I, I know them from our downtown where there are, like, streets that have, like, four lanes all one way, and they mm -hmm. just seem to be built to, like, move cars in and move cars out. 
and I think they're terrible for riding a bike on. But that's not what I'm seeing here, so I found it interesting. You're absolutely right. In Calgary, uh, one-way streets are typically multiple lanes that are one-way, and they are relatively wide, and um, they don't have much speed limit on them. Like um, maybe around 50 or so is the uh, lowest speed limit I, I've yeah. seen on them. So they're typically seen as um, as, as one-way highway, as, as you were saying. So they're typically not pleasant, but that doesn't have to be that way. Um, if you make the lanes a little bit narrower and uh, lower the speed limit, there is no reason one-way streets should not feel safe. A side note on this one, I find it very interesting how they put the, the lights, the street lights. Right. There is one that is on the street and one that is on the bike lane. You know, when we were doing the research about um, um, cycling. This was about winter cities. One of the things that was stopping people from riding more year-round was lighting. So lighting oh. is a very important point. point. Good one, Juan. Thank you for submitting it. Okay, next up is Chad. Chad with an X. The reason I highlighted this one is because it has angle parking. I'm not sure how I feel about angle parking. Often, for, for us here in Western Canada, when I think about angle parking, I think small town where you've got like a main street and there's angle parking, you know, where people pull in to go to the hardware store. Mm -hmm. We don't see a lot of angle parking here. I've, I've seen it around the world. I know some people love it, some people hate it. I think people are split over it. The, the, the concept of using angled parking is that you save and then you can fit more cars, but then you also lose a little bit on the width. Can you fit more cars versus having this on both sides? I don't know. I've heard complaints from some cyclists who don't like riding behind those angle parking lanes because when people back out, they're a back bit out. blind. And so it's hard to be on your bike when someone's backing out. But I think if speeds were low and uh, the street was designed in a way that people were a bit more aware, then yeah, it's an interesting thought. Okay, so next is uh, from Adam. And this is a submission about Sharos. I think mm -hmm. I've talked about Sharos on my channel a lot, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to say anything. What do you think of Sharos? Mm -hmm. On the surface, as cyclists, we don't like them. We like dedicated lanes, right? Yeah. Um, however, I would say it really depends. A lawyer has taught this to me before. <laughs> Any question they ask I didn't also it, know you were a lawyer, yeah. <laughs> the answer is it depends. It depends, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that's true, actually. It depends. I have uh, ridden in one lane uh, one-way roads or, or shared roads with cars where I have felt very comfortable. A good example of it is in Montreal. If you have the right to speed limit um, and if the lanes are narrow enough, they're not dangerous. But if you have a speed limit of, um, you know, 50, 60 K and um, you are sharing the lane, that is meaningless. Yeah. Like that's basically they're pushing you on the side where they would go so close behind you because you're in the way. Um, so the way we have it in Calgary, I don't like them. But do I not like them as a concept? Not at all. I think they could be very um, doable. And I think this uh, submitter, Adam, um, made, a, made a similar point. He says, yes, this does have Sharos, but that's not always a bad thing. Which, mm. What Street Mix with the software here can't show is the, all the traffic coming that can come with this. So our curb bell boats with trees, speed bumps, raised mid-block pedestrian crossings, and of course, narrow lanes, plus mm -hmm. a speed limit that is low, like 25 kilometers per there hour. There you go, yeah. yeah. That's what you're talking about. The one in Montreal was 20K, actually. Yeah, perfect. Right, yeah. In 25K, I can live with that, too. Yeah. So I may have to get over my Cheryl bias, maybe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Um, next, this one comes from a Travis. A shared bus bike lane. Now. <laughs> I've had mixed experiences with these. I think bus bike lanes are great if there's no other cars in them, except for when there's a bus there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then they become pretty scary. Like getting passed by a bus is, uh, is pretty terrifying. And I generally feel more comfortable, I was saying earlier. It may sound counterintuitive, but I feel more comfortable with cars, sharing a lane with a car, rather than sharing a lane with a bus. And I think the difference is that with a bus, we are competing for the uh, farthest right lane. The bus wants the curb because they want the bus stop. 
because they want to, you know, let the the passengers get on and off, and then we also like the curbside. Right. Um, so we are constantly fighting for that curbside lane. And um, the other thing about cars is that it's very easy for them if they're behind you to change the lane, go ahead of you, and then come back to that lane. Whereas for a bus, because it's just a big vehicle, it's very difficult for them, or like the effort is too expensive to go to another lane and then come back to that lane. So they typically get behind you and mm. sometimes very close. Yeah. Having said that, it's also the culture of the city. If they are trained for that and if they keep the distance and they make you feel comfortable. Yeah. Almost, almost if, blocks if you get behind a bus, yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of bus stops, you find yourself stopping. And it's difficult to pass it because there'll be moving cars in the mm -hmm. lane. And then if you do get in front of them, they'll just be coming up behind you anyway once exactly. they're finished with the bus stop. Yeah. So it can be tricky. Yeah, it's interesting. Some of these things come down to like how it's executed. Exactly. Okay, this next one is um, from Astro Alford. But was, what was interesting here to me was sort of the simplicity of the separation between uh, moving car lanes and uh, bikes. These are, he's right, we see a lot of, well not a lot, I'd like to see more of them, but we do see um, lanes separated with a concrete curb like this, the little flowers on here which sort of help as well. Mm -hmm. um, I should point out, I did get the city's Center City Urban Design Guidelines, which details the minimum widths of roads. And I just noticed this, the drive lanes on here are actually 2.4 meters, and the minimum width detailed here is 3.3 meters. So um, technically this would be illegal. Mm -hmm. In Calgary. <laughs> In Calgary. In Calgary, yeah. yeah. Um, I, th I think I think one of your submitters did comment on that. That's not uncommon in other parts of the world, but in Calgary that would be. This I find very similar to the first one that had trees as a barrier. Yeah. Um, so very similar to that. I, I like this. Um, by the way, the first one also had this issue of uh, the narrower lanes. Right, right. So many of the submissions here have that. I mean, just for the record, like I, I didn't like give anyone any rules around this, um, and I don't want to, you know, this is more for fun. We want to mm -hmm. like blue sky these, imagine what they can be. So, but it's just an interesting observation that some of these cool designs wouldn't be allowed in some cities. In some cities, yeah. I do like the barrier very much. Mm -hmm. um, I do like that it has uh, both bike lanes. And this is like we both mentioned in the first design. It's probably the most palatable thing in somewhere like Calgary. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <music> Okay, so this one is from a bike rider from Argentina. That's the name that was submitted. What do you think? Park cars as a barrier between moving vehicles and you on your bike. I have seen this, if I'm not mistaken, in Calgary. I think um, some people call, call this, instead of bike lanes, they call them door lanes. Door lanes. <laughs> yeah. Because it can open at any time and you can get hit by it. I would guess that um, the more experienced cyclists would be okay with it because they are aware of that door being open. They want and love it, but it's better than not having a bike lane. And I think that would not feel comfortable for novice cyclists. So I don't think it would be a very inclusive design. I agree. I think having a parked car beside me on my bike is better than having a moving car, um, but it's not ideal. And I've also found if there's a lot of parked cars, when you come to an intersection, sometimes visibility for both me and a motorist is limited when there's a mm. row of parked cars there. So that uh, can be dangerous as well. But, you know, we have this debate in the comment section of this channel a lot. Is, yeah. is, is something like this better than nothing? Mm. <laughs> you know, I don't know the answer to that. Sometimes I think it's better to just get something like this in and then tweak it later. Okay, next up is Soul version two, referring back to my center city urban design guidelines, minimum travel lanes here in Calgary, 3.35 meters. Um, this submission has driving lanes at 2.8 meters. So, you know, significantly smaller, um, but also makes a point uh, uh, about the safety of that. He included, this, this submitter included a reference to a research study that founds that finds that narrower lanes that are more common in Europe and Asia than in North America and Australia uh, are actually have fewer deaths on them. They actually are more safe. So it's interesting if you just take a little bit off those lanes, how much more space? I mean, there's bike lanes, trees, and sidewalks. Parking. Par and still parking, Most yeah. importantly, parking. <laughs> yeah, most importantly, parking, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting that 
sometimes these engineering standards that we have that were put in place for the presumably for the safety of motorists can also compromise other mm -hmm. other users of the road. Yeah, that's that's a that's a very good point. A lot of things about cars and bicycles might be counterintuitive. So when we actually look at the data and numbers, um, um, we we find otherwise. So that's why, by the way, if I may do a pitch here. That's why science is so important. Thank you. It's important to look at things, to, to measure things, and not just to stick to, to, to fall in love with your opinion. Personal experience, I also would agree with that. I find narrower roads uh, automatically lowers the speed. So I would agree with this um, Soul version 2. Was that him? Yeah, Soul version 2. Yeah. I also um, find interesting that on one side, Soul has Sol version 2 is used, the trees as a barrier, and then on the other side, the parking is a barrier. One of the things when I went to the public hearing about this specific road that was raised by some of the car drivers was that it already feels narrow. And I think narrowing the lanes even more, I totally agree, would slow it down, would make it safer for everybody. I think motorists don't like that. But often they don't get like they don't like things that slow them down and make it safer. Mm -hmm. So you know this is one of the political things yeah. we have to work through. I think as our cities adjust. Okay, next we've got um, Justice, who is from Lithuania, and this one's interesting in that he applied uh, design standards from Vilnius. Um, and one of the things he made in his submission, one point he made was that the city was built with really wide Soviet-era roads. And now they're going back and trying to narrow them a bit more, which is an interesting point to think of a wide road as a very Soviet kind of thing to do. Totally agree with that. I find very wide roads, wide roads, um, give that Soviet era sensation to me. Vibe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, in Calgary, downtown Calgary, we have um, two streets, Fifth and Sixth Avenue, that have four lanes one way plus two parking lanes. And it's very scary. And um, I don't know what is, if, if there is like, a, like I think it's 50K or something. I think it's 50, limit. no, it might be 40 now. But yeah. No, they didn't bring they it didn't down to 40. I did put a request for that and they said, ah, oh, no, those are. Oh. And it feels like it's uh, the end tail of a highway. And this is right in downtown. So I, I, I would agree that if you bike, walk, do anything uh, um, along that, those two streets, it does give that Soviet, like a cold highway kind of feeling um, yeah. rather than a street kind of feeling. So now, what, what do you think about the design? Yeah, this one's, the design's good. I, again, these are narrower lanes, and so you just get so much more space to work with. So these bi-directional bike lanes are not ideal. Uh, you know, I, I, if you have a two-way street, I prefer uh, bike lanes on each side. It just it's, it seems more intuitive to me when you're riding it. But these ones look fine. We've got trees. We've got sidewalk. I think this is a pretty good design. What do you think? But I don't think in Calgary, in Alberta, that can fly. I think I'm not very familiar with that. But I think the mm, province of Alberta doesn't allow um, two-way bike lane in a two-way street. Right. Uh, because that makes the turns very confusing. I mean, if I learned anything from this whole exercise, it's that designing a street is complicated. There's a lot of factors that go into it. So this is an example of that as well. I think city planners are going to love you. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's yeah, complicated. It's, <laughs> everyone likes to complain about city planning, but it's not easy. OK, this one is interesting. I chose it as an example of a parklet. We've lost two parking lanes, a drive lane. We've gained two bike lanes. But one of those lanes is a parklet, which is sort of a mini park. If you don't know what a parklet is, it's like taking uh, what would be sort of road space and turning it into like a mini park. Is that how you would describe it? Yeah, so there are like a small decks that uh, take like a stick out of the sidewalk. I mean, it depends on the country. They use it for different senses. But the more common sense of using parklet is like a deck that sticks out. And it's like a small sitting area. It has some greenery in it. Um, and it's a public realm um, space that is good for, for people. Um, this is from Kyle, who said... Kylie. You, Kylie, thank you. Mm. Kylie, sorry, Kylie. Um, the, about the parklet, it's not just one long park, or one long sort of patio parklet. space. She says that the parklets would alternate between parking spots, sitting areas, bike racks, maybe art displays or bike share docks or any kind of worthwhile public space needed. So 
I mean, that's great uh, to have a street where you would have all kinds of like activations and mm -hmm. things to do, and places to sit, to grab a coffee. I think that's great. That would just make such a change in that street. It'd be wonderful. Uh, we have quite a few uh, pedestrianized streets. So this is one example of a pedestrianized street um, <laughs> where we've just got no cars at all. We've got ample space for people in all sorts of ways, sidewalks. Um, this person, didn't, no, no bikes here either, just walking. I mean, this is kind of a dream scenario. It's, it's interesting to me how many cities have like one pedestrianized shopping street and everybody loves it. Mm -hmm. And then it stops there. <laughs> I often feel like if yeah. everybody loves them, why, why don't we have that? more of yeah. them? Yeah, why don't we have more? <laughs> yeah, but it's a cool design. Uh, there are lots of really interesting pedestrianized streets, getting food trucks on there. You know, th there is some space to move goods down the street like this, which I mm -hmm. think is also helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just nice to think about streets like this. And what I also like about this is that um, it has enough width in the middle for emergency vehicles. So I don't know if that was by design. Let's say it was. Yes. And I like that. I'm sure it was. Yeah. yeah. I like it very much. I mean, it probably will not fly. Um, in that location. In that location. But uh, it's like a park. I love it. Dare to dream. Yeah. It's <laughs> a right. dream. Yeah. Yeah, this one's interesting too. I had not, there was not a lot of designs like this, uh, which is why I chose it, but it's a mid-street parking lane. I don't know that I've ever seen a street like this. Mm -hmm. um, it does give you more space for bike lanes on each side, but what do you think? Mid-street parking lane? I have seen this uh, internationally, not in Canada, not in North America. I haven't seen it, but um, I've seen this, uh, for example, in Iran. Parking is very limited and they allow parking in the middle. So it becomes like a boulevard in the middle. I find this, um, this is specific design. It's, um, they have resolved, I'm, I'm guessing the reason they did this was to resolve the issue of having the door lane issue, like mm -hmm. having the parked car next to the bike lane so they open unexpectedly. Um, this would make it more difficult for the drivers. However, in places that I've seen this does work, um, people would just go a lot more carefully. Um, I think in North America, we are so used to everything be so orderly that we like driving almost I have to say this with a bit of cautious, but almost um, without thinking, mindlessly. Right. Like we just automatically, let's put maybe because that's a better word. Everything is in its place. Everything, like we know that everybody stops at the red light. We know that everybody moves at the green light. Um, but when you are expecting that a door can open at any point, people just go slower. Um, is it a good thing? I don't know. It does work. It does work, and I haven't seen, personally at least, a lot of accidents with it, but people are a lot more vigilant. So so basically this design is, I would say, shifting the risk from the cyclist to the other cars. Right. Um, that, that is a very generous interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess you'd have people moving back and forth across the streets to get into their parked cars back and forth. Yeah, right? so that, that will things slow well. things down a lot, yeah. Right. Okay, this is from Tobias. Um, Tobias is from the Netherlands and said, mm. he has, there they have something called a Fietstraat. You probably do a better job pronouncing that than me. I am not going to try it. <laughs> <laughs> Which means bicycle street. Um, I'm just going to read Tobias' um, description here. Bicycles have the advantage and lots of rooms, but cars are guests. They have the disadvantage and less space. So he couldn't really get this into the design, but that design might work as well. So I think what's going on here is that street mix doesn't allow for this kind of street design. It's very orderly, like we were just talking about. Yeah. Um, and so he's put together a design here with drive lanes, parking lanes, a light rail down the middle. And my interpretation of this, and maybe you think differently, is you know if you think of these all as one shared space, you'd have slow moving vehicles, uh, bikes and pedestrians all walking on space. And if you've been to the Netherlands, you've probably yeah. seen streets like this. And then with a light rail sort of quietly moving by, mm -hmm. you know, in North America, our trains are often separated very, you know, a lot from every other user. They go very fast. They go fast, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I always love seeing those videos of like a slow moving tram down a Dutch street, like often yeah. on grass, not like, you know, like Absolutely. 12 feet of uh, gravel or concrete here. So it's, I think that's what they're getting in here. And that's an interesting thing. Um, I always find these streets interesting too, because you, 
you know, you, you often remove the signage and the lane markings and you just let mm. people negotiate things. Negotiate things on their own. On a, on, a, on a lower speed limit, yeah. Yeah. Like downtown Amsterdam is a good example. And But I've seen, I have done um, where not only the train is like going slowly next to you, but you can actually crisscross on the rails that the train is going and they're aware of it and, you know, they go slower and... Yeah, very, very negotiation was a good word that he used. Yeah. Right. It's, uh, this makes, you, you said this earlier too, which is a, a point worth making. One of the things I was trying to do in this project was not think about the context of the street specifically and just use it as kind of a universal street mm -hmm. that could exist anywhere. But you made the point that context matters. And I think a lot of people who submitted did some research and found on Google Maps what was around this area. And it's really hard. Maybe it's a bad idea to pull a design out and look at it independently. You need to look at the context. Where are we here? Um, this one is from Colby, who has a nice long description um, about something he called, I had to Google this, a chicane. Basically, a chicane means a, uh, a zigzag in the street. Uh, I, I think it comes from car racing. Uh, car racing, sometimes instead of having just a straightaway, they would make a little jog in the street to make the brace more interesting. But a chicane in these contexts slows traffic down. It just like adds some movement mm. so that everyone has to slow down and sort of work their way around. I find this interesting in North America too. We do so much work to make cars have like straight lines and mm -hmm. be very efficient. But when it comes to bike lanes, we often make them like do these long lazy mm -hmm. routes through parks and that kind of mm -hmm. thing too. So a chicane intentionally designed to slow vehicles down would be really interesting. As you were describing that, I was actually thinking older cities that are interesting and they're touristic destinations. They don't have this grid system of, you know, organically we don't live like that. Mm -hmm. And naturally the streets will just shape around life, whatever, like there is nature, there's buildings, there's businesses, whatever happens. And then, I don't know, maybe in North America, where it just so, you know, put a grid on top of everything brutally, you know, if there is trees, just cut them through. Right. And uh, make the grid, and uh, I, I find them less interesting. Okay, this is from David, and he described his as a bit like a, a lunarf, and I know I'm pronouncing this word wrong because I get corrected on it all the time. Um, but this is the concept of a Dutch street um, where vehicles are welcome, but um, they're sort of the last priority. So a street like this would have um, lots of space for people walking and riding their bikes and just existing on the street. Cars can come through, but there's often barriers for them to sort of move around. They must move very slowly. Um, pretty common in residential areas mm -hmm. in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and so you can't see it here, but I think these str these walking areas in the middle would also accommodate cars, but the car drivers on them know their guests and they are not the primary user of that, so they slow mm. right down. So it's an interesting thought. Yeah, I think this looks like a dream. <laughs> so I don't have much more to add to yeah, this. Yeah. That's right. Oh, this one's interesting because this person, it's uh, JP Urbanism-08, who said, he had a goal of putting the highest number of people through as possible. So street mix does give you a number of how many people will move through oh. at the bottom here. And so out of a mixed use, this is, if your only goal is moving people, look at this one, interesting, hey? A mm. bike lane, because bike lanes can move lots of people. Uh, uh, light rail, you know, 16,000 people per hour compared to 12,000 for a bike. Uh, pedestrians, up to 15,000 people per hour. Interestingly, the one that moves the least number of people on the street is the automobile lane. Yeah. Which makes sense. I mean, again, it's one of those counterintuitive things. If you grow up with car brain like me in North America, you think mm -hmm. that the way to get people around is by maximizing the use of vehicles. But this yeah. shows that sometimes that's the most inefficient way of getting through. Okay, this is from Diego. And um, it's an, it had lots of thoughts to put into this one. But it's an interesting design. Um, I, I like this one because he had some outdoor dining, and there are a lot of people who included outdoor dining. We didn't see a lot today, but a lot of people's sub, uh, submissions included that. And to me, that just seemed like sometimes maybe we should put more thought into like just making streets more comfortable for just hanging out sometimes. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know why we're not doing that. Like yeah. streets are supposed to be spaces for people. Also, 
that makes it um, from sociological perspective, I guess, uh, that would also make it much more safer and it would make happier people. If you look into studies done by Gale and, 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 and whatnot, they, they talk about these public spaces a lot. Like that generally contributes to the happiness of the population. Right. We yeah. should consider happiness in our designs. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just want to do a shout out to Alex, who did a whole video on uh, explaining his submission. Um, and it's great. It's a good submission. Um, I'll refer to his video uh, in the link uh, down below so you can check it out. I'm not going to explain it anymore because he did a great job himself. Beautiful. Okay, we're going to leave it at that for now. Uh, thank you, Fernandez, for sharing your, your wisdom and your insight today. That was fun. Thank you so much <laughs> for inviting me. This was so fun. Yeah, great. Yeah. And thanks to everyone for your submissions. This was a, an amazing project. Mm -hmm. I was just blown away by the response and the creativity like out of the 700 plus designs none of them were the same so mm -hmm. it was really an amazing thing Very so thanks to thanks to everybody but wait you didn't think i forgot did you no i did not forget now is the time to roll out the design that the city actually went with did they look at all of your designs no probably not but they have spent years looking at this design in general and here's what they came up with drum roll please Ta-da! So what do you think? Now a little bit of explanation here. So the city basically kept what's already here. There are sidewalks on both sides, two parking lanes and two driving lanes. But interestingly, there is also the addition of a multi-use pathway on one side of the street that's intended for all users, bikes, scooters, pedestrians, everything. Multi-use pathways, as I could see, were not an option in street mix. So I'm sure some of you would have chosen that if it was available. And how did the city do this? Well, I think they may have bent their rules a little bit. The driving lanes are a little bit narrower than what the city guidelines uh, spell out. And um, the overall width of the street is a little bit bigger than what I measured. So I don't know if the city uh, right of way was a bit wider than what was originally built there, but they did manage to squeeze a bit more space out of it. So they kind of cheated. Either way, it's an interesting compromise, I would say, as Farnaz said when I showed this to her, she said, it's a respectable design. I would say it's kind of a people pleaser design. They gave a little bit to everyone, which means it's not fantastic, but it's unlikely to upset too many people. I'm glad there's some space being given over to bikes because that's how I get around most often, but I don't think any of this design is gonna fundamentally change the feel of the street. My fear is that it will still feel dominated by cars, which it does now. There won't be a whole lot of extra space for pedestrians, but it is better. I think this is probably the biggest change we could expect in a car-centric neighborhood, in a car-centric city. And it goes back to that question of, is a mediocre bike infrastructure better than no bike infrastructure? One other thing to note is that there isn't funding in this budget to actually convert the whole street. So it only goes down a couple more blocks that way and then it stops. So if you're ever wondering how gaps in your cycling network in your city happen, here's one example of how it happens. We'll have a multi-use pathway that stops in the middle of a street, goes halfway and doesn't connect on the other end. Hopefully money will come in the budget in the future to fix that. But for now, we've just added one more gap into a city full of them. So there you go. Let me know what you think in the comments. And uh, one huge thanks again to all of you submitted. This was so fun. I had no idea what to expect, but it was just a blast. I looked at all 700 designs myself um, and I was just like thrilled by the creativity and uh, knowledge and wisdom that went into all of that. So thank you for sharing. A reminder, there's another video that will have all of those designs in it. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll do this again sometime. Let me know if you liked it and thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.